Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And I'm your host, Mitch Yuan. Our underwriter is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, which is a program of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. And I'm very pleased today to welcome our guest, Jennifer Potter. Jennifer is the Director of Regulatory Innovations for Stratagen Consulting. But most appropriate for this show, she's a former Hawaii Public Utilities Commissioner. So today we're gonna to be talking story today about the PUC's role in Hawaii's energy policy and how the PUC protects you, the general public. So Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Mitch. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. And you're coming to us all the way from Lahaina. All the way. <laughs> which is a, a good little plane trip. I was over there, I was over in Maui a couple of weeks ago attending the Hawaii Energy Conference. That was kind of interesting. So anyway, just so everybody gets to know a little bit more about you, so we don't just jump into a PowerPoint presentation, how about giving us a little bit of your background? How did you actually get to Hawaii and become a PUC commissioner? By a lot of luck, <laughs> first and foremost. <laughs> oh, so I started my career um, as an electric analyst. I So I started doing low research and, and basically from the very bottom of ranks of the utility industry. So I started with the utility. I spent about 10 years with utilities, including SMUD, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, right. uh, which is one of the most famous municipal utilities. So I was so fortunate to work there. And they were I very progressive, as I recall. I, I had some dealings with uh, SMUD in a previous life, and they were known to be like, big thinkers, thinkers out of the box. So that, like you said, it's probably is really good for you to work with those guys. Absolutely, I learned so much. It was it was a tremendous experience. And that experience led me to Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, where I spent about three years working um, you know, on, on energy research and then moved to Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, where I worked Yay. with <laughs> And so was there until I got swooped up and asked to be commissioner uh, by Governor Ige and um, was confirmed by the Senate in April of 2018 and began my tenure in um, J July. And so uh, it was, it's been, you know, I wow. think I had about 13, 14 years of experience in the industry prior to becoming a commissioner. So a healthy amount, but maybe could have used some more. <laughs> right. Well, they probably threw you in the deep end of the pool. And I guess you had to swim pretty fast. Yes, yes, definitely. So, the, so, the amount of reading. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to get to that in a minute. We have a slide about that. So <laughs> I, I also wanted to point out that you actually came from one of the neighbor islands. I mean, not very many commissioners uh, came from a neighbor island. So would you care to comment on the commute and what it was like, you know, trying to manage you know, just life living on the neighbor island and having to commute over here to Oahu? Yeah, yeah. So it was. Uh, so I actually had to to rent a studio there because I the expectation was that I would spend at least half the week, so three to four days a week there. Um, and I commuted over every every week. And I flew Mokalele Airlines, which is just the best little airline in the world. Um, and it flies, you know, the backside of Mo Molokai, so you can see the beautiful cliffs and. So I had the world's best commute. I have to admit, <laughs> it's like can't complain about that. But I did spend, you know, half the time away from my family, and um, so that's you know the sacrifice that you make, um, you know, in order to fulfill these positions. In particular, when you're a neighbor island commissioner, um, and and that yeah, it's just the it's what you do for public service. <laughs> well, it's probably difficult to recruit or. You had probably had to think long and hard about accepting the uh, the uh, position, I would think, given the time away from home and everything. Absolutely, and I was a, a newlywed. <laughs> oh wow! Was, so that was even, even it was harder. I was like, oh, I really like my husband still, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. Well, thanks for that, and thanks for your service, and and thanks to your dedication to the the people of Hawaii, and uh, you had a really good reputation. You were a great commissioner. And so we're going to hear your your views on how the uh, PUC is uh, taking care of uh, the general public. So let's get on with the first slide, and you can tell us what you're going to talk about. Um, sure. Well, sure. There we go. Yeah, there it is. So yeah, so we're going to go over an overview of the Public Utilities Commission, um, basically who we regulate when we're established, 
then we'll talk a little bit about how the PUC is engaged in Hawaii's energy policy. Uh, that is kind of the, that's the mandate and the marching orders that we have on a day-to-day -day basis carrying out the work that we do. Um, and then we'll talk, discuss some of the priority areas for the PUC uh, today and, and in the past and moving forward into the future. So, so hopefully what we're going to have, you know, I'll take some of the mystery out of the PUC because, you know, I think uh, the general public doesn't really know what the PUC is. It's just a bunch of words. and They might see PUC on the back of a taxi cab yeah. you know, and, their, and their numbers and what all that means. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So let's, uh, let's go on to the next slide. And tell us a little bit about the background of the PUC. You know, what, what are they? When, when do they happen? And what do they do? So, a little yeah. bit more detail. You bet. So the PUC has been around for 110 years, which is an, uh, just a remarkable history. If you think about what they've been able to accomplish and how we've developed the islands and that spun through regulation of what are considered monopolies. Um, so. These utilities that, that the PUC regulates are natural monopolies. They're the electric companies, the gas company, water, wastewater. Um, and so, and, and so these, these companies are typically, um, they need regulation in order to control costs and ensure that investments are prudent and in the public interest. And so the PUC's role and responsibility is really to look out for the public interest and ensure that the, that the utilities are performing up to excellent standards and in, you know, and providing the best service possible to the residents of Hawaii. Um, and and that, that means affordable and dependable. And so those are really one thing that the PUC strives to commit to and, and really, and, and try to, is, is that affordability complex because we're, we're well aware of the, the, the high cost of electricity in the state of Hawaii is, is, is no mystery to anyone. So it's a big mandate. Yeah, it's a huge mandate, and we'll see how many people you guys regulate in one of the follow-on slides. But, you know, we also hear about an organization, I know we're not here to talk about them specifically, but the Consumer Advocates. So, you know, it sounds a lot like the Consumer Advocates. So what's kind of the difference between the two, two organizations? Yeah. Could you care to comment on that? Absolutely. So the Consumer Advocate is involved in every single proceeding in front of the commission. They have some options. There's and there's some exceptions. Um, if there's a te telecommunication, like a, a wireless carrier that comes in and wants a, a cer certification for public convenience, um, and to, basically to do business in the state of Hawaii, the Consumer Advocate typically won't take a position on that. But every other docket there are bread and butter. There, they what, do... What's a docket? Hang on. That was a that was sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. I just want people to know what a docket is like. Yeah, what is so that? It, it's a so it's a, a regulatory filing that's that's submitted to the PUC, um, and it's typically a request for something. It's either it can be a request for a rate increase, it can be a request for a merger, it can be a request for a capital investment. Um, so there there's all different types of proceedings that come before us. There's also investigatory proceedings um, and dockets where the commission can open up a proceeding that looks at uh, how to improve regulation in the state of Hawaii, for example. That was one that, that the PUC opened up on their own. Um, and, and then there was actually subsequent re legislation that said, please take a look at this. So we are very in line with our lawmakers, which is excellent. But okay. um, so yeah, so that's our dockets. Um, the, the consumer advocate is basically does a tremendous amount of the analysis. Uh, behind all, uh, all of the filings. So if they're looking at a rate case, they're the ones that are running the numbers behind the scenes, um, be, you know, behind the PUC scenes and working alongside the applicant, whether that's an electric utility or it's a gas utility or a wastewater utility in order to come to a stipulation or an agreement, if you will, about what's the appropriate investment or you know, so that the consumer advocate can make a recommendation to the PUC about, you know, whether we should proceed or accept or move forward with whatever that application was uh, requesting. So there. So I have a quick. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, so but their their main job is really to look out for the public interest. That is, a, a, they they take public comments. They really are. They're the they're the ones that are digging into the numbers to look for accuracy and ensuring that we keep costs down and affordability. And they they they're they're 
the consumer advocate is a, a very great ally for the PUC. It's I was very, just going to say that. So yeah. uh, looking at the PUC, like how many, how much, how much, how many staff does it require? Because you guys, you guys have to do all these studies and background investigations. You know, you probably have lawyers and and uh, technical guys. I mean, what's the level of staffing for the PUC? So there's approximately 60 people that work there. Um, and there's engineers, compliance people, we have attorneys, we have uh, policy wonks and, and economists and uh, engin I said engineers, but auditors. Um, there's, there's, a, a, there's a huge, and actually even compliance enforcement. So like people that go out in the field and actually enforce some of the, the requirements for our motor carriers, which we'll talk about in a moment. So yeah. the staff of 60, they do a tremendous amount of work. I can't believe the amount of work that, it, that six, those 60 people are able to do. I, and I, I should not fail to mention, we have amazing IT team. There's actually only two of them and they're, really? <laughs> They keep the whole thing, the, the wheels on the bus. So, I mean, if you think about the docket management system, we have a, 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 a repository for all the proceedings. They manage all of those repositories. They manage all of the, the filings and all of that infrastructure that is wow. required for, for basically to do our job on a day-to-day -day really? basis. Well, you guys totally revamped that whole system. I think during your term, that, that, yeah. was, that must have been a monster project. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I, did, I think I lost some hair on that one. <laughs> I know, I know everybody <laughs> did. <laughs> Very good. So, um, and uh, what kind of an annual budget do you have? Do you have any idea? Like how much, how much does it cost? And where does that money come from? So, I kind of know the answer, but I'm going to let you say it. Well, I, I don't know the total budget number because I know that we typically over collect and then send monies back to the general fund. Um, right. So, but there is a 2% surcharge on people's bill. Um, and that's on every, every, every utility bill that we actually, that we, um, that, that our regulated entities to right. give to customers, right? So, so that charge is collected and then passed to the PUC and it's held in a special fund. And if the, at the end of the year, that money is not spent, then we kick that back to the general fund. So that to okay. the state, yep, can use okay. that money. Well, let's let's go on to the next slide because this is going to give people an idea of the magnitude of the job. Right, sixty people regulating over one eighteen hundred entities. So, <laughs> and how so do we, you do that? It, it's it's pretty remarkable. I've, and I have to we you know we'll, we'll talk about this in a moment, but the, the a large majority of these are motor carriers. So we have, okay. you know electricity, gas, telecommunications, um, and then private water and sewage. We do not actually regulate any wireless carriers that, like like T-Mobile or, um, or Sprint or any of those. So they, they, they have to come to us for some merger information for like for mergers, but they don't, we don't regulate them. So telecommunications being more like um, a, a Hawaii Telecom is, is the, basically our main character. There and then, um, then of course the motor and water carriers. So Young Brothers, for example, um, which is just sort of this wild card. If you think about it, and you throw that into who we regulate, it's just seems like whoa. Okay, water carriers. That's different. Most states don't have water carriers, so well, they're not people <laughs> carrying buckets of water either, are they? No, these no. Are, <laughs> these are, this is the inner island uh, uh, tugboats and uh, you know barge service and. That's uh, right. So I looked it up before the show. I think we have two. There's, there's that, and then there's the uh, the little ferry that operates out of Lahaina, right? Yep, the the Honohele, or is is that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, that, is that it? That's that it. Is, that's it. That's it. Those two. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, let's go a little bit more into the next slide and talk about enforcement and you know how you keep people from getting ripped off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, of course, we have state statutes that we, we have to follow. Um, in our case, it's um, Hawaii Revised Statute 269, which is basically that's that's the PUC's mandate. Um, and that's updated pretty much every year by our legislators. They, they do touch that, that those statutes. 
Um, and those we have to follow to the T. And if we don't, we typically end up in the Supreme Court. So it's, it's not a, a it's not a it's not a um, something that you want to mess up on. So we we really do those lawyers that we we employ at the PUC are are really good. They they know their statutes, they know the rules and regulations, including the the um, the administrative rules. Um, the PUC can make administrative rules and also does and also does make changes to those rules, updates them to be make sure that they're current. Um, and then. In, not so, we set policies in terms of how we regulate the utilities, but we don't set state policies, for example. Oh, like they, I was wondering about that. Yeah, yeah the, like the renewable portfolio standard, that would be a state energy policy that, you know, that we wouldn't actually have anything to do with. But we would set policies saying, you know, like net metering, for example, that would be a policy requiring the utility to carry out, you know, net metering. So those are the types of, of, of policies and standards. Also interconnection standards um, for uh, renewable energy assets that are going on and distributed on homes and, and, and uh, businesses. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some, what it does not regulate. So what does it not regulate? We don't do the Honolulu Water, Board of Water Supply or the bus. So, which is which is interesting because a lot of our motor carriers are, you know, they're 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 buses. Yeah. They they carry tourists around, but the the the, the city owned buses um, is not in our jurisdiction, and uh, same with the Board of Water Supply. So, there's a an, a resource on the PUC's website. If you click on reports on the PUC's website, you can find all the annual reports from for decades. They come back and um and they, they they have a lot of information about you know the PUC and and what it does do and what it doesn't do. So okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the public utilities. So I mean this is a uh, hard to read the slide to get on your side, but you know <laughs> you, you know it inside out. So why don't you just read it, give us a run through on this one. Sure, sure. So when we think about energy, uh, we often think about electricity, but we also need to consider gas. So we have a we have a Hawaii gas in the state of Hawaii. Um, right. They buy propane typically to the neighbor islands, which is not regulated. Okay. Uh, but the natural gas is regulated, and that's on the island of Oahu. Uh, there, so the electric utilities are on the Big Island, and then on Maui, which covers Molokai, Lanai, and Maui, and then we have Oahu. There's also KIUC, this Kauai and uh, Kauai uh, oh, yeah. Island Utility Company. Yes. Right. <laughs> so, um, and they are of course under our jurisdiction, but they also have their own board of directors. So, um, so they're not so heavily uh, regulated as as the other as the Hico companies would be. So, and why, um, why is that? Why, why are they? Uh, because Hico yeah. has a board of directors. You know, what's what's the th theory behind that? So they're they're a municipal. So are they're not municipal. They're a co-op, and that co-op means that they're owned by the residents of Kauai. Ah. So they vote in at, and they elect people to represent them from their districts that will make decisions about the course and direction of the utility. And so because they have that framework in place, they don't need the same oversight because they they literally are for the people of the people. And um, it's just a very different business model. So, so the you know, KIUC doesn't uh, doesn't give out dividends like a publicly owned company like the Hico companies. That's correct. But what they so, do do is if there if there is overpayment, so if they overcollect on the revenue requirement, they will actually yeah. offer bill credits and provide bill credits back to the residents because they are a not for profit entity, which is extremely different than the HECO companies, which are yeah. definitely an investor-owned utility, which means that they are for-profit and they do provide dividends and have shareholders and that they, they answer to their, to their board. So it's a very different business model. Right. The majority of the entities that we regulate are motor carriers, and those are those are tour buses. They're, they can, as long as there's seven seats, <laughs> that's oh, really? Is that the cutoff? <laughs> yeah, that's the cutoff. Seven seats or more, and then you need to be regulated by the PUC. So you, you do have to actually come in for a license in order to do business well, in the state of Hawaii. In, in our lineup to the show, uh, yeah, you talked about actual enforcement. You, you actually have PUC people that go inspectors. And so what are they looking for? 
when an inspector so, goes out and inspects a, a motor carrier? So they'd be looking for like tag, like the, if there's there's motor carriers that don't have, you, you mentioned earlier in the show, the PUC, um, you know, on the back of the, the buses and the cars, yeah. and trucks, that there are no labels or signs that are in, indicating that, you know, that, that they are actually registered with the PUC. They would, of course, write them a citation for not coming in and, and applying for a business license or basically the right to do business and one thing we ran into also um, during my tenure was uh, dumping. Uh, so there was actually, uh, there, were, there were motor carriers that were actually dumping waste into areas that were not, it wasn't appropriate. So they were cited as well. So it can be, you know, people that are, that are moving companies that are getting rid of debris, that are doing it in an improper way. And so the PUC actually enforces, you know, compliance with those types of situations. So how do you do that? I mean, do you, do you have a guy trolling along behind in a, in a, in a car and, you know, yeah. uh, a little bit of subterfuge here, like a private yeah. eye? Yeah, kind of. I mean, you, so the, the investigators come over to the neighbor islands uh, usually in, at least once a month. So they'll pay a visit to each island on once a month. And they, they do, they'll kind of park and, and in particular at popular tourist spots and wait and just watch. And, and we also receive complaints. So if there are complaints from the general public that say, you know, this moving company didn't you know, take care of me and there's, you know, we, we need to investigate, you know, the, whether they're on the up and up, you know, are they basically, uh, are they, yeah, <laughs> are they doing their business correctly? Then and those public complaints we take seriously and we do look into those. And so in the, in the case of the dumping, that was one of the, actually a public complaint. So we had to go in and look into that. So there we get tipped off and then there's also just sort of that, that you know, looking, and waiting. <laughs> so I'm just kind of curious, like how many how many of these investigators do you have? I believe there's three. Okay. Yeah. So not many. Okay. Okay. So let's move on. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Now we'll finally get there. Yes. So so basically, traditional utility regulation has has been as we I mentioned earlier. We we look at major projects, um, so capital investment projects long-term plans, so like in integrative resource planning, so like how they're going to procure energy in the future, um, how they plan on uh, implementing customer programs, um, and then also most importantly is rate cases. That's the traditional model of right. for, for utilities. Um, and we also implement energy policy directives, which is, you know, our um, our renewable portfolio standards and our net um, net zero carbon goals and our per, uh, energy efficiency um, goals that we have for 2030. Uh, so we have quite a few policy directives from the legislature that we must carry out. And then um, the PUC also leads several programs, including the Public Benefit Fee Administrator, which is our energy efficiency program in the state of Hawaii, called Hawaii Energy, and then also a one call center. So call before you dig. That's that oh, yeah. PUC. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious, how do you keep track of all this? I mean, this seems like there's hundreds and hundreds of issues and subjects that you have to control. Do you have some master computer system or how does that work? So the, the, the document management system is pretty much the main repository for, for all of the work that we do. Um, and there's, you know, the, the organization of that information is actually quite disastrous because it, there is so much going on. It's difficult to keep tabs on, on everything that's happening. And in, in, in particular, in the compliance section, the commissioners can get pretty far away from that, um, you know, because they just sort of go on and do the business. And, and you know, we're, we only are notified when there's something that's awry. Um, so typically those motor carriers are kind of off the, they're not, they don't receive the same level of attention as you would with perhaps the HECO companies. So the majority of the attention goes to the HECO companies. That's like where I think the commission spends 60% of its time, if not more. So does each uh, commissioner have a, uh, do, do, does each commissioner have its own subject area? Do, do you divide, do you divide all this stuff up among the commissioners and so you get sub dockets that you're you're in charge of. 
Yep, absolutely. Like, kind of like the Supreme Court, and then you all come together and meet and, and then vote. Is that, is that how it works? That's that's how it works, exactly. So that's actually something we implemented when I was there, because I was like, this is crazy. How are we not doing some sort of assigned commissioner to each of these dockets? And which worked really well for me because I focus on, you know, demand side. So what's behind the meter, what's happening in the customer home, that's really my area of expertise. So I was able to take on all of the dockets and proceedings that were focused on that. Whereas the other, for example, the, the old chair and the chair that's not there now, rate cases were their number one priority and that's where they focused their attention. So we did divide and conquer and then bring back that information. And so we meet with the teams and then come back and, and provide information to the other commissioners so that we were more efficient and effective in getting our orders out. Okay, so uh, let's just shoot through to uh, we're we're uh, getting we're, we're actually all, almost out of time. I know it was this is amazing. So I want to shoot to uh, slide ten. I, I'm going to bypass the uh, traditional role in the rate case slide. Let's go to slide ten because I wanted to give everybody an idea of how big these dockets and the files and the workload that's on a commissioner. So what are, what are we seeing here? It looks like a lot of reading. <laughs> that is a lot of reading. So this is this is a HECO rate case. Um, this is the binders. The first binder there is basically the application. And then all of the remaining binders are testimony from different wow. experts and analysis that's been completed and reports that they've done that support their position in the application. So you have to understand, you know, who's making what arguments. We need to be able to dig into the numbers and understand where those investments are going. And, you know, and so it is a tremendous amount of reading. Each one of those binders holds at least 500 pages. So a rate wow. case could be e easily just thousands, thousands of pages. So yeah. it's, yeah. And that on top of all the other reading is a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. And, and then you got to lug all that back. Or get, you got it all online. So you don't have to lug all these books. Back to line to read them at night. You know? <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's go to the next slide, which is uh, talk a little bit about the customer programs. We're going to have to go through the la last two or three slides pretty quickly here. So. Yeah, so, so the PUC does direct the companies and uh, all the companies that we regulate to and to uh, develop customer facing programs. This includes distributed generation, um, so that solar um, plus batteries, there's also demand response programs, there's, uh, it, we authorize technology incentives. So for example, batteries, uh, battery bonus programs, which we just uh, are wrapping up now. Um, and then also time of use rates, which are going to be implemented in 2024 uh, for the state of Hawaii. Um, the EV charger rebate program, the PUC was tasked with taking over that. And we have Hawaii Energy, uh, which is the Energy Efficiency Administrator um, administering those rebates as well. So I wanted to talk the next, let's uh, throw up the next slides, 12. Let's talk a little bit about Hawaii Energy because that's a really important program that uh, a lot of people probably could interface with if they knew a little bit more about it because they actually hand out money. They do, they do, <laughs> and, and good money at that. So yeah. they have several programs. They have programs for every type of customer, whether you're residential, you're multifamily, whether you're low income and you know you, you need just free resources in order to improve your energy consumption. Uh, they they have you know larger scale projects such as like the cooling, um, the uh, the the. Uh, the ocean cooling AC initiative that's been on the books for, I think, 15 years or something. Yeah, so, they, <laughs> so, so they, they are, um, they are our champions that are out there every day, basically providing rebates to our customers throughout the state of Hawaii uh, for improving their energy, people's energy consumption. And so Hawaii Energy is, is re really kind of the face, if you will, of the PUC and of you know, public facing programs. So right. they're, they are um, just a great ally. I have always considered them our right hand and they do tremendous work. They meet every bit of their goals in terms of just you know, offering the incentives to customers. Yeah. That, that produce those energy savings that, that are so necessary for us to meet our energy goals. Yeah. And particularly meeting equity uh, requirements for the uh, low income uh, people. You know, if you have to change your refrigerator or whatever upgrade, you know, they have grants that actually help you pay for that. That's so right. I'm, I'm planning to have them. I think uh, I'm, try, I'm trying to get them on my next show. 
So we can talk a little bit more about that. But yeah, it's a fantastic program and they're doing such a good job. So mm -hmm. uh, let's uh, just go uh, the next slide, slide 13. We have two slides to go. So I'm trying to race through this. Absolutely. No, no worries. So, um, so I, as I mentioned earlier, we have our um, renewable goals. We have the RP, RPS. We also have a carbon neutrality goal. Now we have energy efficiency goals um, that we that we need to meet. And the PUC is really kind of the fire under the feet for a lot of these entities to basically carry out those mandates. Right. Um, and the, the, then the, another huge initiative was the as our utility scale renewable procurement process, which yeah. is competitive bidding process. So for my, what I'm counting, we have well over 300 megawatts of installed solar that's been approved by the PUC, as well as over one gigawatt of, hour of, uh, of, of storage. So, so that's so far on the books. And there, we're already moving into round three of those RFPs. So that will actually extend and create a greater pool of resources available for to us to meet our renewable portfolio standards and our renewable goals. And so we're, we've, um, we've also approved uh, aggregators for demand response programs, and those have been competitively bid as well. So we're trying to bring competition into the market so that we're not dealing with such a static monopoly status. Instead, yeah. we're really encouraging competition. Yeah, and like you said, you know, you need all those 60 people to analyze all these uh, programs because they're high value and they're supposed to last 25 or 30 years. That's right. And uh, it's a huge economic impact on, on the state. So, yeah. so uh, Jennifer, we've, we've uh, gone through uh, this whole program. Yes. And now I'll just throw up the last slide, last slide so people know how to get a hold of Jennifer. Yes. There you go. Great. There she is. Yay. <laughs> and we didn't put her phone number in there. So, so we're going to wrap it up now. Um, and so uh, we've been uh, leaving, uh, we're gonna leave it there. You've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii and talking story with Jennifer Potter, a former PUC commissioner. And today we've been talking story about the PUC's role in implementing uh, Hawaii's energy policies. And most importantly, how the PUC helps protect you, the general public. So thank you, Jennifer, for sharing this knowledge with us. And thank you for your many years of dedicated service as a PUC commissioner. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Mitch. It's been a pleasure to talk story with you. It's great. <laughs> and thanks to our viewers for tuning in. I'm Mitch Ewan. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. <laughs>